Um, all of it looks like all of our attendees are in, so oh. we can get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Division of Rheumatology Grand Rounds. A couple of reminders before we start the session. This session will be recorded and it will be posted later on our website. Um, and there will also be a Q&A session at the end. So please add your questions in the Q&A feature and not in the chat box below. And now I will let Dr. Lude introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Danielle. So it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Isaacs. Dr. Isaacs is a professor of clinical rheumatology at Newcastle University. He has been very prolific with almost 300 publications, many of which have been published in top tier journals, furthering our insights on, in particular, RA pathogenesis and different treatment options. Other than his clinical responsibilities, he's also the director of several local centers including Therapeutics Northeast, Wilson Horn Immunotherapy Center, and then the Newcastle Biomedicine versus Arthritis Experimental Arthritis Center. Dr. Isaacs also shares the Euler Task Force for Therapeutic Monitoring of Biological Drugs. So as you may note, a common theme of these centers and also an area where Dr. Isaacs has excelled and been a pioneer for many years is this development and testing of novel immunotherapies for autoimmune conditions, in particular rheumatoid arthritis aiming not only to treat patients, but to cure them by inducing therapeutic tolerance, a holy grail in the field of autoimmunity. So with that said, I'm very much looking forward to Dr. Isaac's insights and sharing with us his thoughts on rheumatoid arthritis where next. Right, let me just get this. Um... Can you see that, Christian, the full screen version? Looks great, perfect. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Christian, and, and thanks ever so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled and honored to be invited to be giving your grand round today. Um, I was saying to you earlier on, I've not been to the, to the Northwest of the United States and, and um, I'd love to be with you, but maybe one day we'll manage that. So I'm from Newcastle upon Tyne, which in the, is in the Northeast of England. It's about 50 miles from the border with Scotland. And you can see in the background there a, 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 a photograph of the city at about this time of day. So it's five o'clock in the evening here. So I've, talk, I've entitled my talk Rheumatoid Arthritis, What's Next? And what I'm going to present really is actually three distinct pieces of work. And I'm, I'm sorry that none of them are, com are complete yet. So they're all work in progress, but they're very much ideas from the clinic. And I, and I pride myself on work which is largely stimulated from our patients, and, and you'll see what I mean by that. The first slide is always difficult to get to move on, isn't it, in these talks? Oh, here we go. So I'm going to talk about three um, topics. First of all, I'm going to talk about how to manage remission. I'm going to talk about the, the concept that Christian mentioned about possibly curing RA, and then at kind of the other end of the spectrum, a few thoughts about refractory RA. So let's talk about, think about remission to start off with. And I started off as a rheumatologist, actually I started off as a nephrologist, and I really moved into rheumatology because of my interest in tolerance and the possibility to do something useful in diseases like this one, like rheumatoid. And so when I started as a, as a reg registrar in the um, early 90s, I would say about a third of my patients turned up in wheelchairs due to their rheumatoid. Um, their hands often looked like this, and we very rarely saw remission. And of course now remission is the expectation. And I would say, well, I know that in our clinic, 40 to 50% of patients achieve remission uh, about six months after diagnosis. Remission is important for all the obvious reasons. Um, if, if, you, if your disease is well controlled, you don't acquire joint damage, you don't become disabled, you tend not to get the comorbidities of rheumatoid and, and, and you're basically a lot better. But on top of that, of course, increasingly, there's a question whether we need to continue therapy in these patients. Um, there are some, you know, there are a lot of problems with therapy. Patients have to come to the hospital for their monitoring. It costs money. And of course, there's all the toxicities and, and, and the cost of these therapies. So th this is the theme of my first 
um, vignette, if you like. And I'm going to start, I'm not sure if it's on the next slide, but with, the, with a couple of patients and patients' views, because this is a grand round. And Danielle, when I do put the videos, please don't record the videos as we discuss, because the patients haven't given me permission for their uh, pictures to go online, but they're happy for me to show them in the lecture. So this is the first patient. So, so those are two very differing views. And, and actually, we do involve our patients very much in our research. We have a lot of research patient partners who help us to decide what sorts of research we want to do and, and how to frame it. But let's think how common drug free remission is. Um, these are some data from Leiden. And as you know, Leiden had an early RA cohort for many, many years. They were one of the first. And, and in this paper um, from about five years ago, they defined drug-free remission as the sustained absence of synovitis by physical examination for at least one year after treatment discontinuation. And about 17.5% of their patients achieved sustained drug-free remission, um, with normal hack, pain and fatigue resolved. And for what it's worth, autoantibody negative patients and patients with a shorter symptom duration were more likely to achieve drug-free remission. And on the right here, this is another paper from the same group. And this is the window opportunity. And we often think of the window opportunity as improving the outcomes for rheumatoid. And in this example, what you can see is patients who are treated early, less than 12 weeks from symptom onset, are more likely to achieve drug-free remission during follow-up than those who are treated later. You will be familiar, I'm sure, with the best study um, of, I think it's one of the best studies. I think it was a really nice strategy study, um, again, from the Netherlands. And i just show you some data from BEST in terms of drug free remission. You might recall that despite the varied strategies here, pretty much all the groups did as well as one another as long as they were treated to target. But in terms of drug free remission, in BEST during the five years of follow-up, about 23% achieved drug free remission. Um, it didn't matter which group they were in to start off with, as I've mentioned. And about half of those um, sustained remission for a median of 24 months of five years after five years of follow-up. So maybe we're down to about 11 to 12%. And those who restarted their therapy, their disease became controlled very readily afterwards. And this is a further paper from BEST from, again, five years ago. This is a 10-year follow-up looking at various outcomes here. And these ones at the bottom are the drug-free remission patients. And again, it's about 14%. So we see anything from 12 to 20% of drug free remission in most cohorts. So what does it all mean? And, and this is a, a bit of a concept slide. As you, as, as, as you heard at the beginning, I'm really interested in immune tolerance. And I often ask myself, if we can get patients into drug free remission, has their disease gone away? How, you know, has, has tolerance come, come, back, come back? And the reason I ask that question is that if we think of the healthy immune system as a balance of self-aggression and self-regulation. In a patient with a disease like rheumatoid, there's an imbalance. And, and we often talk of dysregulated autoreactivity, and that's sort of supported by some of the genetic findings. So in autoimmunity, in autoimmunity, autoreactivity, the ability to respond to self has become dysregulated and, and aggression wins over regulation. We then give some therapy, which leads the system to be rebalanced again for whatever reason. But what we've just seen is in maybe 15% of patients, you can stop the therapy and the disease doesn't come back, at least for a significant period of time. So does that mean the immune regulation has been reset? Does that mean the disease has actually gone away um, and will never come back in some of those patients? So the question that we're trying to answer is whether drug free remission equates with reinstatement of immune tolerance in at least some patients. And in order to achieve that, we used to think that you used to have to treat patients really aggressively. So, for example, stem cell transplantation to really wipe out the immune system and let it reform. But actually, we now know from our own work that you don't need to. I, I sometimes call drugs like methotrexate giving the immune system a nudge in the right direction. And then it seems to reset itself such that you can withdraw the drugs in some patients. So if that's the case, then we should be able to achieve drug free remission in a subset of patients without the need for aggressive therapy. So that, again, coming back to that question, is autoimmunity reversible or is it a one-way street? 
is it cure? And, and this is a really tough question, as, as you're probably already thinking. Um, how do we decide? How do you know that the disease isn't going to come back down the line? Maybe it will in everybody. I'm not sure we actually know the answer to that. And in my head, the real issue is the issue of biomarkers. Um, we talk about biomarkers a lot these days in all sorts of areas of our research. Um, but here's a particular example. And you might say, well, why am I showing you blood pressure and heart attacks? It's because, you know, we have plenty of antihypertensive drugs. The reason we give antihypertensive drugs is not because it's nice to be able to lower the blood pressure. It's because by lowering the blood pressure, we prevent heart attacks maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years later. But just imagine if we'd never invented a sphygmomanometer and couldn't measure blood pressure, it would be pretty difficult to develop drugs to prevent heart attacks because you, it's, it's hard to develop something without a biomarker if that event's going to happen five years, 10 years later. And I would argue that that's where we are with immune tolerance, because in a disease like rheumatoid, we can diagnose a disease relatively readily these days using autoantibodies, maybe understanding a bit about the genetics. But when you think about it, what we measure in the clinic is inflammation and damage. And these are quite downstream of where the action is, which is the immune system. So we're trying to affect the patient's immune system, but actually we're measuring something beyond that. And what we really need to be able to measure is what I would call the immune state. And so if we could do that, we could much more easily develop drugs for tolerance induction. And going back to the um, drug-free remission, we might be able to identify the patients who really have returned their immune state to normal and, and, and clearly were immune tolerant. So it's, it's something we think about a lot in Newcastle. And this is just one study that we've now completed, and you can read the published study, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we called it Biora, Biomarkers of Remission in Rheumatoid Arthritis. And essentially what we did, or, or Ken Baker, one of my fellows did, was to select patients who were in remission on treatment. And the, these, I should stress, are patients on synthetic DMARDs. We don't what I'm really talking about here is synthetic DMARDs. I think it's much more difficult to do this research in patients on biologics because they tend to flare more. We knew from the literature that when you stop synthetic DMARDs in patients in remission, only about 50% flare and 50% achieve drug-free remission. So what Ken did is, is found some patients, um, they agreed to withdraw their drugs. And at that point in time, he took blood for various sorts of biomarkers and then followed the patients for six months and some flared and some didn't flare as predicted. And then the idea of the work was to compare their baseline parameters to try and identify biomarkers which correlated with drug-free remission. And the question in our head is, were they biomarkers of tolerance? So, and that's, that's the um, reference if you want to, to look at it. The first thing to say is that the literature is right. So it's interesting, actually, in all of these studies, almost exactly 50% of patients flare over six months. I, you know, I challenge you to find a study where this isn't the case on synthetic DMARDs. In this study, we looked at ultrasound remission as well as clinical remission, although I'm not convinced the ultrasound remission adds very much. The median time to flare was 48 days. So this was probably, these patients were on methotrexate, sulfazalazine, hydroxychloroquine, various combinations. So the median flare was 49 days, and a lot of this would have been what we would call methotrexate withdrawal, but then the rest of the patients were still in remission at six months, the, the, um, the other half. In terms of biomarkers, this was a relatively small study, so it was only 44 patients, and the data on this slide are very much subject to overfitting, but Ken did find some genes in the CD4 T cells, a cytokine in the serum, and a clinical marker baseline, which were very good at distinguishing patients who remained in remission and patients who flared. And how about that for a rock curve? But of course it's overfitted. So this work needs to be replicated. And in fact, we're doing that now on a much larger scale in this so-called bioflare study. So that was biomarkers of remission. This is biological factors that limit sustained remission in rheumatoid. So very much based on Biora, exactly the same strategy, patients on synthetic DMARDs, drugs withdrawn at baseline, 
But in this case, as well as focusing on the baseline, we were really interested in what happens at these various follow-up time points. And what we were really interested here is trying to identify the pathways that preceded the patient flaring. And in fact, we've now finished recruitment for Biora because of Bioflare. Because of COVID, we didn't quite manage our 180. Um, but I have to say, as someone who recruits to trials a lot, we've never had it so easy. Patients were just desperate to come off their drugs. And, and we actually were over recruiting to this study before the pandemic. And, and we're analyzing the data now. And I can't, I'm afraid I can't go into the data because they are still unpublished. But we are seeing some interesting signals, both in terms of differences of baseline from, between flare and emission and in the follow up period. No, no big surprises, I suppose, but, but, but very clear signals, which hopefully in the future might help us to determine which patients we can withdraw drugs from safely. Um, and this is a big MRC funded study um, across a few centres. And we also, in fact, in this study, we're also taking synovium at flare and in patients who consent, even at baseline, to look at their emissions synovium. The question in my head, again, it comes back to whether what, what we are looking at here. It's interesting because we always, again, all the studies tend, I've not seen a study with more than 20% of drug free remission, and I've not seen a study with less than 10% or less than 12%. So it's always around about 15% of patients achieve drug free remission. So the question in my head is, is there something special about 15% of patients, or is it something to do with the way we manage the disease these days? Um, so you could imagine, for example, that patients who achieve drug free remission may simply have less of a genetic predisposition to rheumatoid. They may just carry fewer SNPs than those patients who don't achieve drug free remission, a bit like you know, an, an RA endotype. Or is it something to do with the way we're treating the patients? We know that early treatment increases in likely, but I showed you that before. And these are some data actually from the Leiden group. Um, Annette van der Helm um, published this uh, systematic literature review. And what they're showing from the various Leiden cohorts is that these are the very early cohorts, just treated with NSAIDs, for example, or no metotrexate. And these are the more recent cohorts of treat to target and very early treatment. And you can see that perhaps as the years have gone by, we're achieving slightly better proportions of patients here, maybe 20% versus 12% down here. But it's, you know, we're not getting to 50, 60%. So to me, this suggests that even with early treatment, we're not going to really end up with huge numbers of drug free remission. So to me, it suggests that there is a patient factor, which I suspect is going to come down to the genetics of the disease in terms of who can achieve drug free remission. We know that seronegative disease is easier, but not all the patients are seronegative. Okay. <clears throat> So that's all I'm going to talk to you about remission at the moment, because that's where we've got to. I'm now going to talk about this, the C word, the cure word. And I was saying to Christian earlier that when I came into this again back in the early 90s, I moved into rheumatology from nephrology because I was interested in the concept of tolerance. But in those days, you couldn't really talk about it. And in fact, I remember writing a review for Nature Reviews Immunology, I think it was, um, about what I'm going to talk about. And they wouldn't, when I got the reviews back from the reviewers, they, they changed almost nothing in the review text, but I had cure in the title and they didn't like that. They said, you're, not, you're never gonna cure rheumatoid. So we had to change the title to something about long-term remission. And it's interesting how, how things have changed in a relatively short space of time. So this is self-tolerance. It's a little bit like that figure I've already shown you, how immune system spends its time responding to the outside world whilst avoiding responses to self. And I, I think you're all very familiar with this sort of picture. And as you've just heard, um, we're very interested in whether this is a reversible state, either using simple drugs like methotrexate in very early disease, or perhaps using more potent drugs in later disease. So is it an irreversible process or a malleable state such that we can switch off the, the disease? This is where it all started for me. So I, I, in 1987, I went to Cambridge to, to read for my PhD with my mentor, Herman Waldman. And I didn't do what, I wasn't working with mice in those days. I was interested in antibody engineering, but this is work that was going on in the lab at the time. And it captivated me because I thought this was so interesting. 
and it was what switched me into a rheumatologist really so I'll just take you through this just so you know what we're talking about it's what we call therapeutic tolerance now but what my my sort of student colleagues were showing was that in, in this cartoon, if you transplant white skin onto a brown mouse and do nothing else, as you know, after a week or two, that white skin gets rejected. But what was very innovative at the time, and I found fascinating, was if you injected that or treated that brown mouse with monoclonal antibodies, for example, anti-CD4, anti-CD8, but other things worked as well, just for a couple of weeks, but during the time period that the transplant was taking place, that transplant would never get rejected, so that white skin would stay on for the life of the mouse, even though the antibodies were only there transiently. And yet if you put grey skin, for example, onto that mouse, it would still get rejected. So it was a very specific, it wasn't immunosuppression, it's what we would now call therapeutic tolerance. And furthermore, you could take splenocytes from that brown mouse, put them into another brown mouse, and that second brown mouse would now tolerate white skin. So it was a very potent process. You were definitely altering the immune system. And we now talk about infectious tolerance and regulatory T cells. So we, have a, we now have a substrate for what was going on. But back then, we didn't really understand it. It was very phenomenological, but very powerful. And importantly, you didn't need to kill the lymphocytes to achieve this. You could use non-depleting anti-CD4 and anti-CD8 monoclonal antibodies and achieve this. So to me, it was translatable to the clinical situation. Many years then went past where people tried to use such concepts to treat diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, not terribly successfully, um, and we still haven't achieved this. But again, for me, it comes back to the biomarkers. Um, you know, I, I actually think that we were possibly measuring the wrong thing, that if, um, going back to that model earlier on, if you're trying to modulate the immune system but measuring inflammation, the trouble is in a disease like rheumatoid, a, 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 toler a tolerogenic drug may not actually be anti-inflammatory in two to three weeks. This sort of process on this slide takes six months to, to really embed itself. And in terms of a clinical trial, you can't leave a patient for six months um, to see what's going to happen. And basically, we assumed that the treatment had failed and treated the patient with steroids or something else after a few weeks. Um, and so when maybe we were just missing the outcome. And I, was telling, I was telling Christian earlier on that the penny dropped for me um, with one of my own trials. We, we used to be able to make our own antibodies in the lab and put them into patients. We, we can't do that anymore. But I was running a trial of combination therapy with an anti-CD4 and, and an anti-TNF, both of which we created ourselves. And the idea was to suppress inflammation with the anti-TNF and then follow it up with anti-CD4. And it was quite an intensive regime over three months. And essentially, the anti-TNF seemed to work, but the anti-CD4 didn't seem to do anything because after we finished the course of anti-TNF, the patients flared and we curtailed the, the trial, actually. We thought, well, this isn't working. We followed the patients for safety. And what we found is two or three years later, the patients were coming back saying, well, you told us it wasn't working but my disease seems to be more responsive these days. Prior to your trial, nothing worked. Now I respond to some of the drugs that previously failed. And that was when the biomarker concept really embedded itself in my head. I thought, well, maybe we were just measuring the wrong thing and, and we should have been measuring the immune system, except that we didn't have the tools in those days. So going back to tolerance induction, we talk of antigen non-specific tolerance, and that's what I've just shown you with antibodies such as anti-CD4, anti-CD3, maybe stem cell transplantation, but re-educating the entire immune system versus antigen specific, where you're hopefully just tolerizing to the autoantigen when you know what that is. Um, an allergy, for example, we talk of desensitization. Just a couple of slides on anti-CD3. Um, I worked on anti-CD3 in the lab in my antibody engineering days. And it's turned out to be quite a potent drug, and you may be familiar with some of this work, not from my own group, but, for, but from groups of others. So anti-CD3 seems to be quite useful at inducing tolerance, certainly in mouse models. Um, anti-CD3 will target any cell with a T-cell receptor on it. Um, it inactivates the effector cells, perhaps via apoptosis or energy or just modulation of the T-cell receptor, and then regulatory T-cells seem to take, take over. And animal models show very clearly that this is what's happening in the pancreas and it 
and it reverses diabetes in, in various mouse models. So this is actually 15 years old now, this study. I can't believe it because I remember when this came out. But this was a study in patients with recent onset type 1 diabetes. They'd required insulin for less than four weeks, young, mainly young men. And they just got six days of anti-CD3, a so-called non-activating a glycosyl anti-CD3. This is the one that I worked on in the lab as it happens. Um, six daily infusions. So this was the insulin requirement at baseline. There was a placebo group and an active group. And then if you look 18 months later, this is 18 months after just six days of treatment, the placebo group required more insulin, as you might expect. The treatment group almost required less insulin than they did at baseline. They certainly hadn't progressed in that six-month period. And then if you follow these same patients up over four years, the first thing to say is their diabetic control is the same, whether they were in the active treatment group or the control treatment group. And you can see the, 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 the controls slowly, slowly require more insulin. But actually, so did the treatment patients, although at four years, they're scarcely any, any different to what they were at baseline. So again, going back to the biomarkers, without biomarkers, I couldn't tell you whether, these, whether some of these patients had been cured and would never uh, end up with end-stage diabetes or whether some of them had been switched off. But what I could tell you is after just six days of treatment, you've got an effect lasting out for four years. And you could imagine giving a similar treatment maybe once a year to maintain that state. So, I still think anti-CD3 is a very interesting treatment in terms of tolerance. But most people these days are interested in antigen-specific therapies because in theory, they're much more selective. They only tolerate the T cells that are auto-reactive. Various ways of doing it. And what's actually very satisfying to me, going from a situation where nobody would even talk about tolerance, though, you know, 20, 30 years ago, these are just a selection of small startup biotechs using different ways of tolerizing, hopefully, to, to specific peptide antigens or some sort of antigens. I'm not gonna go into this in detail because there's just too much here. It's a talk on it in its own right, but lots of innovative ways of switching off, potentially switching off T cells. I'm gonna talk briefly about our own work. And again, much of this is published, so I'm not gonna go into details, but we are developing tolerogenic dendritic cells. And, and this is the basic science in these references and there's others actually. Um, but essentially what Amy and Kat have done over the years, they've shown that we can take um, CD14 monocytes from peripheral blood, either from healthy donors or patients with rheumatoid, differentiate them into, tolerant, in, into dendritic cells using the usual IL-4 plus GMCSF cytokine cocktail. But if you expose them to dexamethasone on day three and day six, and vitamin D3 on day six, along with a maturation stimulus such as a TLR4 ligand, we end up with these stable tolerogenic dendritic cells, which can present antigen. They have intermediate co-stimulatory molecule expression. And importantly, they produce a lot of IL-10 and TGF beta, but no IL-12. Very robust in the test tube. They essentially um, lead to the production of what you would call TR1 cells, producing lots of IL-10. Um, this summarizes the preclinical work. And actually, I'm not going to go through each of these in turn, um, because again, they're all in these publications and, and the talk's being um, recorded. So you, you can come back to this if you're interested. It's a work of a big team. These are just a few of the individuals who I feel have done the key work over the years. Just one slide on, on our phase one trial, which again has now been published four years ago, so you may be familiar with it. This was a dose range in phase one safety trial. And when we were developing tolerogenic dendritic cells, the question I often got asked when I went to conferences and talked about it was, well, what if they're unstable? What if you put them into a patient with rheumatoid and actually they end up not being tolerogenic, but stimulatory? aren't you then going to get really bad disease? And actually, we knew from the mouse work that we had done that you probably would. And it was, we didn't think it was a risk because in the, in the lab, we tried really hard to break the tolerance um, phenotype of these dendritic cells um, unsuccessfully. We couldn't break it. This was really before modern epigenetics had, had taken off. So we couldn't show why, but we just thought they were stable. But for our phase one study, in a sense, to prove that we thought they were stable or to prove they were stable, we took patients with rheumatoid that had an inflamed knee joint. And what we did, um, 
these patients were leukophoresed, which is, this is how we had to um, obtain their monocytes. So, so we leukophoresed them, their, their cells went to our GMP laboratory and they came back a, a week later as toll DCs. We then, via an arthroscope, washed out that joint and injected the cells. And we knew from the literature that inflammation would slowly come back over a, over a period of weeks. But our hypothesis was that, it was, was that because this was a, had recently been an inflammatory environment, we weren't going to clear all the inflammation away. And so we were putting the cells into effectively an, an inflammatory space. And we hypothesized that if they were going to become stimulatory, we would actually provoke a flare. Um, back then, and you know, we were planning these experiments 15 years ago, we didn't really know what autoantigens to choose, and so we used autologous synovial fluid, which again the literature told us contained autoantigens. So we, li we, li we literally loaded our dendritic cells with autologous fluid from the same patients, and, and, and that was incorporated during the GMP process. So the outcome of the trial was that we didn't see any flares, um, not only over five days, but over extended periods. The cells could be produced reliably, despite quite an intensive protocol, the patients felt it was acceptable. And actually the high dose group, we saw a couple of patients in a high dose group who didn't flare for three months, but I, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's efficacious, it's very anecdotal, no control group, but it was an interesting um, observation. So that was now, we published that four years ago and, and we're gearing up, but just one other slide is, you know, where do you want these cells to go? Um, presumably you want them to go to lymph nodes and the spleen. So this is just one patient in whom we radio labeled the cells before we injected them into a knee. And we, we hypothesized that in order for them to work, we'd like to see them go to the groin. And this was, uh, time zero, and this is almost 24 hours later. And actually, what you can see is that th these are images of the knee, and as you would expect, the radioactivity decays. This is Indian 111 with a half-life, I think, about 72 hours. So over 20 hours, the signal does decay, and at least within the sensitivity of the, of the imaging, we couldn't see any migrations to lymph nodes. And when you think about it, this is an inflamed knee. So you probably wouldn't um, expect the cells to migrate away from the knee, but this was kind of a proof of principle. So in Autodecra 2, which we're gearing up for now, things are a little bit different. So we're taking patients now of a known tissue type, um, shared epitope positive 0401. And this is our hypothesis that in order for the toll DCs to work, they have to get to the secondary lymphoid tissues. They're not gonna do much use if they just stay in the knee. So we're going to load the cells with citronellated peptides on this occasion because we're now sufficiently confident that these are autoantigens. Um, now we were hoping to label the cells with an MRI dye for reasons I'm not gonna go into today. We're probably not gonna be able to do that now. Um, so we won't be able to track the cells in vivo, which had been the hope, but we're going to use different injection routes. We're gonna still go into articular, but now into a non-inflamed joint, probably a wrist, or perhaps a knee. We're also going to inject them intradermally. And actually as a positive control, we're going to inject cells directly into lymph nodes. Let's say, forget the MRI, we hoped we were gonna do this, but as of a couple of weeks ago, that now looks less likely. But what we are going to do is a lot of immune monitoring. So going back to the biomarkers, we, because we know what peptides the cells are going to be loaded with, we can detect those auto-reactive T cells with techniques such as MHC, peptide tetramers. We're doing a lot of work on that in the lab at the moment to show that we can identify the autoreactive T cells, which means we can look at their phenotype. We're going to attempt to do some single cell RNA sequencing before and after treatment to see whether those autoreactive cells change. And we're also going to be using autoantibody arrays to see whether we change the serology. So we're hoping that this is going, well, it will start next year or it won't start at all if we don't get going next year because um, it has to for various reasons. But, you know, there's, there's unexpected consequences of the pandemic. It's put us way behind, not just because of the closure of labs for a period, but I was saying to Christian earlier, I showed you that you need a, a um, adjuvant to get those cells finally mature. And guess where all the adjuvants have gone over the last 18 months? 
all into COVID vaccines. So we're actually really struggling to get hold of the agents that we need to manufacture ourselves now, um, but, but we're getting there. So that's all to DECRA too. So just to finish up then, my third vignette is refractory rheumatoid. And, and just one aspect I'm gonna talk about here. Again, it's an ongoing trial, but I thought you might be interested in. So you're probably familiar with this. This is the um, response rate to anti-TNFs. I think this is infliximab, adalimumab, etanercept, rituximab, tocilizumab, and abatacept. And as you all recall, if you're a clinical rheumatologist, we always see this same pattern of about 50% ACR20, 30% ACR50, 10% ACR70, really regardless of the therapy, which is always a bit weird. These are slightly higher because these, this is the first biologic in these patients, and these three trials had already had an anti-TNF. So we often call about, we often talk about the 60, 40, 20, or the 50, 30, 10 pattern of responsiveness. And it's often, you know, we, sometimes we talk about this in terms of precision medicine, wouldn't it be good to choose the right drug in the right patient? But it's still not very good, is it? 10% ACL70 um, is not great. So I have thought about this for years, and, and why do we always see the same pattern? Even with the um, JAK inhibitors, it's not much better than this. So we see this pattern of response repeatedly. The other observation from, from the clinic, I run a refractory clinic for patients who haven't responded to anything. And the other thing that struck me as odd over the years is some patients come in with really very evident clinical synovitis, for example, in their wrists and their MCP joints. It looks very inflammatory. But when my colleague Ben Thompson performs an ultrasound, sure, there's synovitis in those joints. You can see the synovium there, but there's no Doppler signal. So that's unexpected. And actually what I say to the patient is that the drugs do work. You're on an anti-TNF or you're on an anti-IL-6. And actually the suppression, the inflammation has gone. They're doing their job, but there's something left behind which is causing you to be unwell. And it doesn't, to me, look like it's inflammatory, at least from these sorts of images. So this is not uncommon. So I go back to this figure, which I, I drew for review many, many years ago. Um, I think when I first moved to Newcastle. And, and we tend to think of all the immune cells, don't we? So the T cells, the, the monocytes and their products, the B cells down there. And what we've forgotten about a lot until quite recently is these cells in the middle, the fibroblasts. We've often, you know, and we, we think of them as scaffolding and, and just supporting cells, except that we don't now with single cell sequencing. And actually I've worked with Chris Buckley for 20 odd years, and he's always told me the fibroblasts are important, but we didn't listen to him until recently. And now he's obviously proving us right. So we often talk about fibroblasts as quasi-malignant cells in rheumatoid. They're highly proliferative. They ignore tissue boundaries. Obviously, they eat into the, into the cartilage and the bone. So they're a little bit like cancer. Um, they upregulate oncogenes. They do produce some inflammatory cytokines. So I'm not sure they're the answer to the question I'm asking here, but it, there's a hypothesis behind all of this. Um, and we know they become epigenetically modified. So the first thing is I've often talked about the fibroblasts as the, wind, you know, the cells underpinning the wind of opportunity. So maybe the reason it's easier to control rheumatoid early is because the fibroblasts haven't taken off yet. And actually we've got good drugs for the inflammatory and the immune parts of rheumatoid arthritis like metatrexate, but we don't have much to treat the fibroblast with. So that's the first thing. But more relevant to this bit of my talk is maybe the fibroblasts underpin refractory RA and the therapeutic ceiling. So the therapeutic ceiling is why do we always see that 50, 30, 10 response regardless of the drug? It's like there's a ceiling that we can't go above. So I put it to you that maybe this part of the disease, the 50, 30, 10 or the 60, 40, 20, is actually the disease activity the attributable, attributable to inflammation. And no matter how good your anti-inflammatory drug is, you're not going to get any better than that. And maybe the rest of it that we're not very good at treating is actually fibroblastic disease. And, and that's the refractory element of rheumatoid that we always struggle with. So we're testing that right now in this trial called Traffic. Um, and we're looking at patients who are on a biologic therapy, not rituximab, but anti-TNF or abatacept or tocilizumab, who... Their disease has responded a bit, so they've gone from high disease into moderate disease activity, 
but we can't get them into the low disease activity remission part with the biologic drug alone. And the hypothesis is that we're going to add in an anti-fibroblast drug to see whether we can push the disease into that remission area. And this is a trial I'm very proud to be doing with my colleagues in our Center of Excellence, funded by Versus Arthritis. I'm sure you're familiar with Chris Buckley and Ian McKinney's. Chris was in Birmingham, now in Oxford, and Ian from Glasgow, just up the road. And in fact, now that Chris has, has moved to Oxford, Karim Raza has joined us from Birmingham. So there's now four um, centers in this Center of Excellence. So this is the traffic trial. We're using a drug called Selisiclib or Arboscovitin, which is an experimental anti-cancer drug. <coughs> and it's a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor, inhibits three CDKs. Um, in vitro, it inhibits human RA synovial fibroblast proliferation. And as you'll see on the next slide, it also has potential beneficial effects on macrophages and neutrophils. So these three cells that we're not very good at targeting in rheumatoid are all targeted via this one drug and it works in mouse arthritis. Without going into too much detail, it's, it's a bit of a multifaceted drug. So by inhibiting CDK2, it will directly inhibit synovial fibroblast proliferation. Interestingly, it also upregulates the endogenous cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor P21. So that will also suppress synovial fibroblast proliferation and inhibit several pro-inflammatory cytokines through an effect on JNK signaling. And finally, it inhibits CDK79, which decreases this, this pathway, MCL1, which will actually lead to apoptosis of the fibroblast, but also macrophages and neutrophils. So it's a bit of a, what I would call a domestos therapy. I don't really have domestos in this state, but they used to say it kills all known germs. This seems to kill all known cells in the rheumatoid synovium. Um, so we call it targeting the RI synovial fibroblast by a cyclin-dependent kinase position or traffic, again funded by the Medical Research Council. It's a two-part study. The first part was dose finding. And one of the nice things about this study is we've used very modern trial design. So part one was a so-called Bayesian continuous reassessment modeling. I'm not going to go into details because I can see the time is running out, but it's in, this is the protocol, this is the statistical design, and this is the results of part one. <coughs> so in part one, we wanted to identify the maximum tolerated dose for part two. And the nice thing about Bayesian studies, you often don't have to use as many patients as you think. So we thought we were going to have to treat seven cohorts, 21 patients. In fact, by the time we got to 15 patients, we knew where we were and we had identified the dose for part two. So a really good example of where Bayesian design is a very efficient trial design and you can often use fewer patients than you thought you needed to. Part two is an efficacy trial. Again, it's a single arm, so-called Hearn's early phase design. Again, it's all, this is our protocol paper, so it's all in there. Relatively small, we're looking for a signal. We're not looking for you know, definitive efficacy. 12 weeks of dosing, this was just four weeks in part one. And we're using clinical um, MRI, PET scanning, and histological outcomes. Sadly, I'm afraid this is in progress. We've got four patients left to recruit. Actually, again, had it not been proposed, we'd have finished. We had actually had recruited all the patients, but four of them didn't make the end point before COVID struck and we had to withdraw them, which is all a bit sad. So we're, we're, we've now got four patients left to recruit and we should be finishing early in next year. But they're quite exciting studies. So I think it's the first study to target the, the, the rheumatoid synovial fibroblast fire its proliferation, or perhaps in any way. So to conclude, that there has been a transformation in RA outcomes over the past 30 years, but there's the main significant unmet need. Because of the improved care, we need to better understand and manage remission. And it's still unclear to me whether drug free remission, at least in some patients, could mean they're cured, but I suspect it could do. Um, there are considerable efforts being diverted testing concepts of tolerance induction in the rheumatoid, but a bit like the drug for remission, we need those biomarkers of the immune state before we can readily develop those drugs, a bit like the blood pressure drugs I mentioned. And then finally, I talked about the fibroblast and whether the fibroblast can explain firstly the window of opportunity, but in the context of this talk, whether it can um, explain the therapeutic ceiling. And, and these sorts of therapies are starting to be applied in rheumatoid. So thanks for listening. I'm not going to go through all the people who have helped, but it's a big team effort, as you can imagine. 
for all these different parts of the, of the work. So I'll leave it there. And I hope I've not gone on too long and there's a little bit of time for questions. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Isaacs. This is fascinating. And I'm sure we'll have some questions popping up here now. We have two so far, and let's start with one of them that relates, I think, to your